What's up guys, it's Dull Matter here, and today we are going to be reacting to part 5 of Extra History's Kosro Anushira, Anushira 1 uh, series. So, it's been probably close to a month since we reacted to part 4. Been uh, doing a bunch of other videos, finally got back to this. Uh, and this one is called On Top of the Worlds. So this is the final one in this series. Uh, so I'm assuming it'll eventually, you know, show his, all the way up to his death, I'm assuming. Uh, and, well, I guess technically they have a part six, which is the lies, where they correct anything, that, any mistakes they made. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to see, you know, where we go with this. Uh, we actually just did the Zoroastrian vis video by Kogito, um, which I had, uh, somebody had suggested in one of the other Kosro videos, um, because I had mentioned that I don't know too much about Zoroastrianism. It was a really interesting video. Uh, but anyway, link to the original video down below, and let's jump into it. Kosro had been at the top of the world. Now he lay tossing and turning on a bed far from his royal palace, surrounded by an army that couldn't even right, stand, much less plague. raise a sword. And as word of Khosrow's illness traveled home, it reached the ears of his son, Anuch Zad. Yeah, the plague of Justinian, right? He got infected by it. Anush Zad had been locked in prison. Not the Fortress of Oblivion, there were too many Kavad-shaped holes in that particular jail. No, a different prison just outside Tessiphon. The young man had been caught getting busy with some of Khosrow's wives, and was locked away as punishment. Well... <laughs> it's like some fucking Pornhub type stuff, but he's just like banging his dad's wives. It's kinda weird, but okay. Briefly, it turns out that jailbreaking skills ran in the family. Just like the Mazdakites had flocked to Kaus a decade prior, Christians in Khosrow's court began flocking to his Christian son, Anushzad. But here, Khosrow's reform efforts came to his rescue. Even though the army he had led against Rome was now devastated by plague, he still had plenty of loyal soldiers serving back home. When one of them brought word of Anushzad's rebellion, Khosrow sent the man back with two objectives. Kill the Christians and capture my son. The fight. And there seems to be a theme in this family is them taking the kingdom, empire, whatever, from you know, rebelling against their fathers, and then yeah, seems to be a, a constant issue: rebelling against siblings, fathers, um, somebody, you know, some relative. Fight was bloody. Khosrow's generals quickly overpowered Anish Zad, who had little military experience, but the young man refused to be captured. He died fighting alongside his followers, who were quickly rounded up and put to the sword. Khosrow prided himself on his open-mindedness, and once boasted that he had not rejected anyone for belonging to a different religion or people. But while he continued to defend Christianity's right to exist within his empire, he began to view certain Christians as political threats. Those who had supported Anush Zad seemed to demand a ruler who shared their faith. And already, Khosrow had seen two territories on his western border try to leave his empire to join Christian Rome. The political power of Christianity threatened to overwhelm Iran, and Khosrow had to stop it. On the Man, honestly, kind of a problem you have with a lot of religions, not just Christianity, although Christianity is probably one of the, the more famous ones just because it's such a famous religion. Um, but a lot of the time when you have these religious minorities within your state, uh, you know, empire, country, whatever, um, they want somebody with their religious beliefs on top, uh, or they want the laws to reflect their religious beliefs. Um, yeah. Kind of get into the... It's it's, it's, it's interesting, because it's like one of those things that like when you look back at history, it, it, I don't know how to say this, but it's like... Um, it's interesting how people, like, how few people used it as, like, a tactic. Some did, especially, you know, more recently, right? Like, when you get to, like, the era of, like, colonialism and stuff. But uh, prior to that, like, people didn't really use it as a tactic, but it really should have been used as a tactic sooner. Uh, anyway. Egg had forced him to make peace with Justinian, but that very peace allowed him to turn his attention toward Justinian's allies. Christians from Ethiopia had crossed over into Yemen decades before, and during the war, Justinian had tried to convince them to attack Iran across the Persian Gulf. They would have done it too if they didn't have so many of their own civil war issues to deal with. Khosrow seized this opportunity. He marched his army into Yemen, pushed back the Ethiopians, and installed a loyal Arabic king. In a single move, he not only managed to push Justinian's allies out of the region and replace them with his own, but he also locked down the last sea route to India. 
Now, both Rome and Africa would have to go through his ports and pay his taxes if they wanted luxury spices, silks, and teas from the east. Unfortunately, Rome I understand, right? Like, obviously they have to go through the Red Sea, but why Africa? Why, do they not have any ports over here? Cosro's control of the eastern trade soon put him at odds with his own allies. You remember those Heftalites who killed Cosro's grandfather? Kavad had eventually sought revenge for that offense by waging several wars against them, after using their help and technology mm. to secure his own throne, of course. But, as always, it fell to Cosro to finish the job. He teamed up with the Northern Turks to attack the Heftalites from multiple directions, and together they wiped the Heftalite Empire off the face of the earth. Khosrow took a chunk out of their old southern territory, and left the rest to the Turks so they could form their own new kingdom in the north. The Turks settled right in, and started trading with merchants from the Silk Road. They wanted to follow Iran's lead and sell their new luxury goods to the Romans at a huge markup. But to get to Rome, they would have to go through Iran. They naturally assumed that their old ally Khosrow would be cool about this and give them a lower tax rate, but Khosrow did not be cool. He had just secured the last few silk trade routes for his empire. Why would he want to give up that monopoly? So Yeah, I feel like here you're kind of screwed if you do, screwed if you don't, right? Because if, if you do, then it's going to empower them, like, way too much, especially for them being on your border. And, and everything you just did kind of becomes, like, useless, right? Because you still have these people trading, uh, you know, outside of your system. But if you don't, then you anger the very people that allowed you to get into power in the first place. It, it, like, realistically, there's like almost no good move to make here. So he sent the Turks away empty-handed. And naturally, they were furious. But the Turks had learned a few tricks during their time allied with Khosro. They sent a message to Rome, proposing that the two of them team up to form a pincer around Iran, exactly like Khosro had urged them to do to the Hephthalites. Now, Justinian had passed away at this point and left the throne to his nephew, Justin II. And Rome wasn't doing so hot. All of the looming problems of Justinian's grand and ambitious reign had collapsed onto his nephew. The treasury was empty, the army was stretched thin, and Justin was just not the same savvy operator his uncle had been. Justin resented the annual tribute that Justinian had agreed to pay Iran for guarding the Caucasian gates. And destroying Iran seemed like the best solution. Mm -hmm. Which maybe it would have been if he'd had a competent army or money, or any advantage at all, really. Bottle, the one bottle, advantage the he'd expected he to have didn't materialize. The Turks never got their army together to support Rome's attack. But Justin wanted this war now, and Khosrow's growing distrust of the Christians in his empire soon provoked it. In an effort to prevent any more of his border territories from switching sides, Khosrow sent an administrator to the Christian province of Greater Armenia with orders to strengthen Zoroastrian worship there. Despite the objections of the Armenians, who had long ago oh, been promised you. religious freedom, Khosrow's official built a new Zoroastrian fire temple. The Armenians reached out to Justin, asking if he would support them switching sides. And of course he would. So they launched their war in the most dramatic way possible. The Armenians killed Khosrow's official, and Ooh. Justin immediately halted his tribute to Iran. Khosrow cracked his knuckles at this and replied, All right, kiddo, let me show you why your uncle learned never to mess with me. This is yeah. not. It's. I, I. Like. So, the one thing I'm kind of wondering here were they allowed. So, like, what exactly do they mean by, you know, religious tolerance, right? Because. Were the Armenians allowed to worship their own, like, were they allowed to, like, worship Christian, Christianity, I guess? Uh, or was Christianity supposed to be exclusive there? Because it really doesn't seem like he's doing anything against what he promised by establishing a temple there, right? Like, he's not doing forceful conversions. Um, like, obviously, the, the, the goal is to convert people by having the temple there. But it doesn't seem like he's doing forceful conversions, uh, unless he just omitted that. Um... So were the Armenians just pissed that it was there in general, or was it not supposed to be there at all? Were they supposed to have, like, was that supposed to be, like, a total Christian area? I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, I wonder what exactly the, the, the agreement was with Armenia. Armies of Iran swept into eastern Rome. Khosrow relished this chance to finish what he'd started 30 years Age ago. 30 and years. despite being 70 years old now, he led the armies himself. They swept up towns along the border while Justin's troops languished in a siege in an Armenian city not far from Dara. 
furious that his army had accomplished so little while Iran had conquered so much, Justin abruptly fired his general and left his troops in a panic. They abandoned the siege and fled, leaving their weapons and equipment behind. Oof. Khosro sauntered over to the abandoned war camp, picked up those weapons with a thank you very much, and set off to conquer Dara. It had been 72 years since the Romans built that fort in violation of the treaty they once had with Iran, and to Khosro, that meant that it was well past time. This is something I don't like. Like, he frames this like that they violated the treaty, but he himself said that the that they had invaded Rome, and that's why Rome built it, right? I mean, clearly he was the one to initiate, well, I guess technically it would have been his, it was his father, no, his grandfather. His father or grandfather, whichever one, I can't remember now, but, um, you know, it had initially been the Persians who had invaded Rome and breached the treaty, right? Them building defense fortifications after being invaded doesn't breach a treaty that's clearly already being breached, right? That's, <laughs> that's like saying when, uh, you know, Germany declared, or when, you know, the UK declared war on Germany in World War II because they invaded Poland, that uh, they had breached the peace agreement in World War I, even though Germany was very clearly the one that, you know, started that. ...that Dara fell. He spared no expense. He diverted an entire river and cut all of the aqueducts to break the city's water supply. Then he carved rocks from the mountains themselves to build ramparts that would let his troops storm over the wall. Dara, that monument to Roman treachery and stubborn defiance, finally fell. When Justin heard about this loss, it broke him. He descended into madness, literally snapping at the attendants who tried to nurse him back to health. <laughs> During a rare moment of lucidity, Justin's wife, Sophia, convinced him to appoint his general Tiberius as co-emperor. She also negotiated a short truce with Cosro and bought Rome time to stabilize. In return, Khosro got to have free reign in Armenia, which the truce now left unprotected. He quickly moved his army over there and began sacking cities, while Tiberius struggled to put his army back together. It took five years, but he did it. He was finally ready to take on Khosro. The old Shah was so preoccupied leading his troops over in Armenia that this newly rejuvenated Roman force caught him by surprise. They circled his camp at night and forced him to flee, abandoning his oh, pavilion and an all of the uh, riches he gathered. His retreat path led across a river, but while Khosro crossed safely on the back of an elephant, many of his troops were swept away. Only by wreaking havoc and setting fire to the towns on the other side of the river did he manage to throw off the Roman pursuit and escape to the safety of Iranian land. The shame of this defeat compelled Khosro to pass a new law, forbidding future shahs from leading armies into battle. He returned to Tesiphon and let his generals take the lead. <laughs> That's such like an, e uh, an ego thing, right? I fucked up, therefore no shah should be in battle. Now, just realistically, you probably, like, I, I know at the time, and like pretty much up until like the end of the medieval para period, uh, it was pretty common for, you know, a lot of states for the, you know, for, like, warrior kings and uh, warrior emperors and, like, this kind of concept. That was pretty much the standard up until, like, the early modern period, um, with few exceptions. But it really is kind of funny that, like, he's like, yeah, I fucked up, therefore nobody should be in this position anymore. But that being said, I mean, they really shouldn't be, right? Uh, assuming that you're, you have a, an administrator, the administrator should not be fighting because if they die then now all of a sudden, like, I guess technically the throne would go to their next of kin, uh, right, usually the firstborn son or whatever, depends on the system, but it, it just seems like, it seems like such an ego thing to be like, yeah, I fucked up, therefore no one can do this. <laughs> the excited Roman generals pushed their advantage, but they pushed too far, handing an easy victory back to Iran that stabilized the war. Both sides sought peace at this point. An embassy from Tiberius was on its way to Iran like for approval of the final like terms, but before it even reached Tesiphon, Khosro died of old age. Khosro had built upon the groundwork laid by his father to remake an empire and create an Iranian golden age. But that golden age ended with him. His son rejected the peace terms with Rome and went back to war. He quarreled with the Arabic allies who had so long guarded Iran's southern border. The Turks saw this long-awaited opportunity and struck at his overextended armies. In the end, even the court turned against Khosrow's son and overthrew him. In the decades that followed, the Sasanian dynasty struggled to maintain the vast army Khosrow had built, 
They struggled to support the centers of learning Cosro had cherished, and ultimately, they fell. Not to Rome, and not to Christianity, but to the Muslims, a new force that rose up from the south. And here, perhaps, Cosro found his legacy. Because while his descendants had failed to keep the empire together, the Muslims studied his way of governing Iran and adopted it. They admired his university and brought its wisdom back with them to Baghdad. But that is a story for another day. Thanks for Yeah, and all of that would kind of lead to the Islamic Golden Age. And then the Turk and then, you know, the Turks would go and take it over, and then you'd have like the Seljuk Empire, but um yeah, it, 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 the one thing I've, I've, I've mentioned this before, but I find it fascinating how, like, he messed up, and then he's like, yeah, nobody's allowed to do this anymore. It, it, it's just so funny to me, and, like, it kind of, you know, I, I don't know if it would really be considered dark humor. It's not that dark, but it's still, the ego part of that is hilarious to me. But anyway, let me know what you think below, and, uh, yeah, we'll do part six, which is the lies sometime soon, which is uh, where they correct any mistakes they made which i've seen quite a few in here um the, the one I, I i keep pointing out is the fact that like they keep trying to frame rome building the uh defensive positions at dara as if rome were the one to break the treaty but the reason rome built those defensive positions is i can't remember if it was his father i think it was his father uh had attacked rome when they had the treaty right they had this non-aggression pact and i believe it was either his father or his grandfather i believe it was his father had attacked rome so then Rome built the defenses afterwards, and then, like, the entire time after that, like, they even say that, and then the entire time after that, like, framing it as if Rome broke the tree. It's like, how does that even work? But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.